Thank you. I hope you can hear me well. It's a great honor and, and pleasure to be with you all, with friends and new colleagues. I will oscillate between the very macro and the very micro and try to suggest to you several years of research and data and new projects that may be helpful in the topic of uh, what lawyers are facing at this present time, lawyers with intersectional backgrounds with multiple minority identities. Um, we, of course, have the, the uh, huge issue in the room now of COVID-19, particularly in the United States and elsewhere. And what we will view as uh, work going forward, even in the law profession, is very much a work in progress. Just uh, September 1st uh, this, of this year, I was uh, fortunate with my colleagues at Harvard and uh, Rutgers University to receive funding to start a new national center funded by the Department of Health and Human Services um, to focus on what employment is going to look like uh, during and post COVID. One of those projects now is, I believe, among the largest, if not the largest, uh, longitudinal survey of lawyers, American lawyers, um, looking at issues of disability, intersectionality, LGBTQ uh, identification, uh, race, gender, age, and as in part funded by the American Bar Association, began in 2019 prior to the onset of COVID. So we actually have kind of a natural experiment given our next wave is going out in the spring of surveys post COVID. We surveyed about uh, 3,500 lawyers who responded. We surveyed about 200,000 lawyers across the United States, but the complete responses that were usable are about 3,500 from every state in the United States and the District of Columbia from law firms of all sizes, from public and private uh, entities, from judges, from academics, from in-house counsel to um, leading counsel from all over the country. Our survey was designed in collaboration with a blue ribbon panel of about 50 leading uh, lawyers with disabilities and from the LGBTQ community uh, around the United States. What happened essentially was the American Bar Association was particularly interested uh, in what is called uh, implicit or unconscious bias, which is of course very popular now. There are some methodological issues with how it's been measured. And they had conducted a number of large studies on the basis of race and gender. They wanted to push out and understand not only the nature of implicit bias facing lawyers with disabilities and those who are who identify as LGB. Um, and I, of course, in a pretentious way said, implicit bias, what about explicit bias? Let's take a look at the whole gamut. So long story short, after about a six months to a year of development, we rolled out this survey. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about the results in the brief time that I have. Uh, we are on our fourth paper now. I believe the conference organizers have made the papers available to you. Uh, the first paper was a descriptive analysis, which was based on remarks I gave at the University of District of Columbia Law Review at one of their meetings. The second paper just focuses on the issue of workplace accommodations with some fairly counterintuitive findings. The third paper is going to be the subject of a special issue of the American Journal of Law and Medicine with leading commentators from across the communities who have submitted uh, comments and who will be discussing the implications of the study. And the paper in works now has to do with uh, issues of disclosure and stigma and bias sort of coming out as a person with a disability and a person from multiple minority communities. I should also say the obvious, that we try to take a very non-monochromatic view of disability, LGBTQ, and other multiple social and personable identities 
to say that all disabilities are uh, monochromatic, of course, is incorrect and, and does a dis great disservice. We have in our survey looked at in great depth the nature of disability, uh, the reporting of disability, the nature of self-identification, the nature of self-disclosure, the nature of perceptions of the workplace and organizational culture in the workplace. Now, we oversampled lawyers with disabilities and lawyers from the LGBTQ community in part because there are no data of this kind and we wanted to get as broad a representation as we could. About 25% of our sample identified as lawyers having a, uh, a disability or health condition or some other related impairment. About 16%, which is much higher, uh, identified as LGBTQ. I should say, by the way, that in the legal profession, for example, in the United States, there's less than 1% of lawyers who self-identify as having disabilities. And we can talk about the reasons uh, for that. So we oversampled. However, uh, we have a very strong representative cross-section, in my view, on the basis of race, gender, age, ethnicity, and other characteristics, which comport with other national labor statistics. So they are fairly representative in that regard. From a very sweeping perspective, we find strong, high reports of discrimination, particularly subtle discrimination, not overt, faced by lawyers with disabilities and in the LGBTQ community. It is particularly um, of the most subtle kind that is recounted in, in very disturbing ways by many of these lawyers and not of the overt kind. Interestingly, in the context of workplace accommodations, and again, I apologize, in about 10 minutes, I'm telling you hundreds of pages of writing, so please refer to those articles if you would like. We studied, for example, in-depth workplace accommodations on the, on the basis of disability. And you might expect that lawyers in this day and age would receive workplace accommodations, particularly in the legal context where these lawyers, presumably many of them were aware of legal rights and human rights and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, counterintuitively, uh, we find, for example, generally across all the types of accommodations that as expected based in these regression analyses, these fancy multivariate analyses, which, which are intuitively based, that People with multiple minority identities, particularly disabled, particularly with mental health disabilities, particularly from the LGB community, request high numbers of uh, accommodations as compared to like individuals, white males uh, without disabilities, women without disabilities, and so forth. And somewhat surprisingly, perhaps not to the folks on this phone, at least to us as researchers, we found that although their requests were at the highest prevalence levels, in fact, those individuals most often receiving workplace accommodations were white non-disabled males who were older with economic power in the firms. And among the least likely individuals to receive workplace accommodations across all ages and types of firms were lawyers with disabilities lawyers in the LGB community, and women. So, of course, we have to think about that quite hard. We are going to look at, as I say, in our second wave survey, we're going to drill down a lot deeper into some of these findings, these counterintuitive findings, high levels of reported discrimination, high levels of non-granting of workplace accommodations, and the particular nature of the discrimination that was faced by these individuals as well. Now, what are we learning? Uh, big picture, I'll say a few comments about that and then I will end. I'm not keeping close track of my time, so please cut me off if, if I exceed the time. Um, well, clearly the game changer in the United States has been uh, COVID-19 from a work task, work group, and work design 
uh, approach. There was just a comment that popped up on the screen. Where can we get your papers? And the organizers of this session have the published papers, I believe, and have submitted them on the blogs. Uh, I'm delighted to, um, uh, to send them to you if, if you don't have them. The first one was in a law review. The others are in peer-reviewed journals um, of very high caliber. And, um, and uh, my co-authors uh, are from very diverse communities as well who, t who come from this uh, at a, a, with particular vantage points. I have shared the papers, yes, on the summit. Uh, a comment came up for those who can't see it. So the questions we are asking going forward is why such high prevalence still? Why, when in the United States at least, there have been literally tens, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on diversity and inclusion in the legal profession? President Obama, to his credit, trained about 30,000 U.S. Department of Justice lawyers on implicit bias, but the needle is not moving. The needle is not moving for lawyers with disabilities, either at the entry level and sustaining in the legal profession or attaining leadership positions in the firm. Uh, the same is true, but less so for LGB lawyers, um, and the same is less true for women lawyers, for example, perhaps the largest sea change we've seen in the United States in the last 25 years is greater gender equality in the legal profession. However, studies show that women lawyers are leaving at much higher numbers the profession than men, and uh, still the economic power in the legal profession in the United States is concentrated uh, in white males, basically. Uh, changes are occurring in terms of client awareness Changes are occurring in terms of community and client expectations, and changes are occurring in the nature of work. For example, when I, I have one minute to conclude. When I first started this study, uh, remote work was kind of the oddity. Now, all lawyers basically are working remotely. <laughs> so we will see great changes going forward in this area. I'm delighted to discuss in much, much greater detail the nature of the studies. The second wave survey is going out in the spring. And um, our new center, our new national center, is taking a particularly close look at these issues from an intersectional perspective and a fluid perspective. That is, all of this is influenced by context, time, organizational culture, and other variables external to the individual as well that interact with personal identities. <clears throat> So I will stop there just to be on time. And uh, as the good lawyers on the firm, the barristers and others know, for those of us that litigate, I've just begun to clear my throat in 10 minutes, but I will stop there.